in postdoctoral training at Harvard, the Harvard Medical School, and the Massachusetts General Hospital, and has been here for almost 10 years. And um, Dr. Ping today will tell us about shedding light on 3D living systems. Thank you. Um, do I need to open? Can, uh, can, I, can I work? Okay, good. Okay, so, so today I'm going to talk about some of the, um, and kind of a summary of our research in past five years. It's mainly about how to imagine living system in 3D. And um, the reason that is actually is a very challenging research area is because microscope or microscopy, and I would say any traditional image system, if you think about it, it actually is not really a good match to live, live samples. So first of all, when we talk about imaging, we talk about the image plan is a 2D plan, object plan is a 2D plan. So everything is 2D, but nothing lives in 2D. Everything, see, you, we walk or we run, we live in a, two, a 3D dimension, and all the living systems are 3D. So that's basically inherently give you a conflict, how we map a two, 3D structure into a 2D image plan. And also, to make things even worse, when we study, I mean, I guess the first optic course you take is 202, like ray trace. We trace the ray straight. But light actually scatters in tissue. In reality, I would say most of the time light, um, light doesn't travel in a straight way in the living system. So that makes things even worse. And the third, we said, I mean, when I take an image, we want a good SNR, and a good SNR comes from a lot of signal, a lot of photons. But when you're dealing with imaging with live samples, actually 99% of label people use are fluorophore. It's because can biochemically they can tag fluorophore specifically to certain molecules, certain structure. I mean, kind of using it as a target to help us them to understand the certain functions. So fluorophore, unfortunately, are very fragile. And they were eventually bleached under light. So in average, a good fluorophore giving out about a million photons. And then by that time, it averagely was just bleached away. So in other words, that you don't have unlimited photons. So sometimes I joke that if I give you a million dollars, you can spend it fast, you can still spend it slow, but I only got one million, nothing more. So that means that everything has a fixed, working with a fixed budget. You just don't have enough. A, a limited photon to help you improve your SNR. And uh, also, we said, I mean, we want to image fast, especially when you do 3D, you need to multiple layers of 2D image, stick them together. So if we have to improve, improve our frame rate in order to image in 3D very fast. And because the sample is moving, it's changing all the time. But your faster image, you definitely need a higher photon flux. Usually that's achieved by increased uh, illumination power put more light on the sample. But living systems are very fragile. They are very sensitive to photon toxicity and the thermal damage. And I think you can easily understand the thermal damage. Photon toxicity basically is the same reason we got sunburn. So all the wavelengths give you a sunburn to some extent, but shorter wavelengths just do more damage. That's why the sunscreen kind of block UV uh, wavelengths. But uh, if you shine a laser light on the, on the Cell, before you burn it up, you will notice that the cell become unhappy. The, be, the biochemical behavior, the, uh, the underlying reaction within it is going to change. And also the reason you got a sunburn is mostly because DNA damage due to UV light in, your, in the skin, skin cells. So that means you can't just have improved photon flux. Well, even if you want to spend that million dollar in a second, you won't be able to. And the last, if you want to do high resolution imaging, you want more, a lot of more photon. And, and also the question biologists ask about a living system often requires sub-micron resolution. So in the end, if you look at all those comparisons that you basically have a very hard topic, you don't have unlimited photon, you can't pump out the photon fast, 
But in the other end, the biologist said, I want 100 frames per second. I want 0.3 nanometer resolution. I want to be able to see 3D live. I want to see a 4D movie. So to do that, there are three things we need to address. First is the penetration limit. So since light scatters in tissue, how we send light deeper and get signal, photon signal from that deep layer out. The second is the photon budget. We work on the million dollar budget. It actually is not much, it's not very high. So how we use that budget in the most efficient way. The third, how we improve the speed limit. So some, to some extent, the speed limit is also associated to the photon budget limit. If, obviously, if you use your photon wisely, then you should be able to push up the speed. So with that three limits, we can compare that um, traditional image method with the problem we are facing. So first, penetration limit in live tissue. So if you do a simulation, this is a simulation result from a paper about seven years ago. Um, if you do a simulation starting with a perfect collimated Gaussian beam, shooting it through a scattered medium that roughly mimic a tissue, you will see that uh, you, within the first 100 to 200 micron, the light has, um, base, has um, very little scattering. So by that time here, here we said, uh, so this is the dashed line here marked with what we call the mean free pass, MFP. That means by this time, um, in average, every photon gets scattered once. So within this region, it's called a ballistic region. So you pretty much can assume tra light travels straight. So my cross, traditional microscopy works relatively well here. But beyond this one mean, uh, one mean free pass, light starts to scatter. It still mostly traveled forward, but then it just like you has start to have a random distribu angle distribution. And by the time you reach a so-called transport mean free pass, that means that beyond this edge, the light actually loses the, the, tran the transportation of a photon loses direction and become a complete random work. So I would say so far, really, um, as my crops, you really there's no much you can do beyond this. The TM uh, transport mean free pass. A lot of work is going on on improved performance within this intermediate region. So the big question is, within this region, still, since the light still largely travel forward, how, to we, how, we, how do we improve the performance? Because microscopy always in, involves you, know, you have illumination, you send light in, and you have a detector, you use the objective lens to collect the light out. So the problem actually has two parts. So first, how we send the illumination straight in, keep it straight. And also, how if I have a signal down here, is when it go travel backwards, it's going to suffer through the same scattering. How we uh, how I collect that photon signal when there is strong scattering? So with these two problem, you can see that in terms of imaging here is basically a diagram and compare different image method. Microscopy is somewhere here. So in general, you only have a penetration of about one mean free pass, and uh, then if you go to uh, there are image methods that give you better penetration, but unfortunately, if you compare penetration versus resolution, it's basically the line kind of all travel along this line here. So basically, if you try to import uh, penetration, a lot of times end up lose the resolution. So keeping in mind that the penetration limit is not something that absolutely it's something we can manage, but often some method end up uh, sacrifice the resolution in the meantime. So that's something we actually don't want. We want to be able, we want to, I mean, if you have, we work on an image uh, technique, we want this area to be as parallel as to the axis as possible, meaning that when we improve penetration, we don't want to lose uh, the resolution in the same time. So here is a diagram that shows you the street uh, where mostly used image measuring in about bio research. So we'll start with wide field imaging. So all those are fluorescence imaging. As I said, 99% label are fluorescence. Um, can here, the, for wide field imaging, basically you eliminate a whole area. And your camera is focused to a certain layer. So in the, the light actually going to generate fluorescence emission in all layers, but only one layer is in focus. The other layers basically become a blurry background like this. So that's definitely not something you like. 
that's why a lot of people, time people like to use so confocal scanning microscopy, meaning that you try using a single beam focused on a single point here. And this beam is going to excite a signal, for instance, the signal along its path. But only add, uh, if we put a pinhole in front of the detector, I'm going to block all the other emission from the autofocus layer and only allow those, uh, the, the uh, emission from the central, uh, the focal point to pass through and go into the detector. That gives you a very clear sectioned background kind of uh, image. But when you look at those two methods, they have a common problem, is that uh, even though you only detect one point or one layer, you are eliminated the entire path through the sample. So the here and there, above and below the focal plane, you're, st you're still exciting and uh, generate for us as a photon. You're not using it. In the wide field imaging approach, this becomes a background. In the confocal, it's slightly better. You, you filter it, block it away. But uh, these are really, you, uh, those, but in either case, you know, uh, both, in both cases, it's not an idea. You actually throw away photon signal. And those are really precious $1 million so you don't actually throw away in a pseudo pinhole. So then that comes two photon scanning imaging. Two photon scanning imaging and uh, so tri uh, common uh, fluorescence imaging, you, we usually call it one photon fluorescence, meaning that you use excited light wavelengths to excite for flow forward from the ground state to excite state and let it emit a fluorescence photon. But with two photon, you actually rely on a two photon absorption to excite to flow for. So this is a nonlinear process. That means that uh, absorption strength is depend on the square of the light intensity. So even with, with two photon scanning imaging, you still focus the lasers through the sample. But when the absorption really only happens when you focus the laser into the tight point. And above and below the focal point that the intensity is so low, the two photon absorption is really not strong. So that way you can see that even though you still shine the light through the entire sample, you're not generating photons in other layers. So that improves your photon efficiency. And also, by the way, the, because it's a two photon absorption, so usually this uh, laser is an uh, infrared laser. Infrared laser actually scatters less in tissue. And also, it causes less uh, pho uh, phototoxicity, so you probably you won't get sunburn with a r red light. So, um, so there's many benefits of this. That's why actually two photon imaging is widely used, in, especially for live imaging or live animal imaging. So, it's actually, actually is a good answer to the first two problem: penetration limit and uh, photon budget limit. But I have to use but. If you look at imaging here, you can see that even one photon is wasteful. You, you have to admire that the one photon signal is super strong. And the two photon signal is very weak. Because two photon absorption is just like millions of times weaker than the one photon absorption. So that means you have to use, because you have to use a laser with ultra high light intensity. In a certain you can't achieve that with a CW laser. You have to use ultra, ultra fast pulse laser. And ultra fast pulse laser, the, the pulse only lasts to say 100 femtosecond, and then the, the, the gravitation rate is in 100 megahertz. So the duty cycle is very low. That also means that you don't have a lot of photon per second. In the other way is also because it requires such high intensity, you have to focus the laser down, even with a high power TISAVA laser. You don't have to focus into a single point and scan it across the sample. In general, every time you do a scanning image, it's going to be slower than the camera, wide field or camera uh, capture. So that means that it, with this existing common stream measure, really we don't have a good answer for those three limits here. So here comes some special 3D image measure that improve your photon efficiency. So in the past, uh, like 15, 20 years, people have really worked on how we uh, kind of break away from the traditional image method, how we develop an image method specialized for 3D imaging. The first side, uh, the idea is we certainly have to improve the photon efficiency so we don't throw out autofocus uh, photon anymore. So one approach is to use optical projection tomography. It's actually exactly the same um, idea 
behind the um, same, roughly same as a computer tomography. You shine the light over the entire sample. You can look at the shadow of the sample, or maybe use a filter to basically collect a fluorescent emission from the sample. And then you just take a multiple projection image in a uh, different angle. In the end, you just use the same radiant tra inverse radiant transform to reconstruct the 3D sample. So this we actually, even though you are sh still shine the entire sample, but you are collecting all the photons from the entire sample. You not try to really throw away something, anything, or decide this is background, this is not in focus. So that is one approach. It definitely include the, uh, improve the photon efficiency by collecting everything. Another thinking is if I can't, I'm not interested in all other layers, can I just eliminate this single layer, not the whole thing? So that generates the so-called selected plane illumination, meaning that you basically confine illumination from the side, uh, sending your information from the side, confined into a single plane, and then your image from the uh, kind of in a 90 degree angle through a camera. So this approach, and see that every time I take a plane image, I can remove this plan, animation plane up and down, and give me a stack of 3D image. So both works. But if you look at those really the original ideas, it does improve the photon efficiency, sort of a kind of address the photon budget limit problem but it doesn't improve the penetration much. Here, you still want to in, 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 uh, image the whole embryo or sample. And if there's scatter going on within the embryo, you end up with very blurry projection image. And here, even I illuminate, said I want to illuminate a single layer, but this uh, illumination has to penetrate the entire sample. I hope it can replace remain to be a single plan, but with the scattering, may actually become very destruct, become very scattered, and uh, you probably won't have a very defined emission plan by, the, by this end. And also, emission from this illuminated plan has to travel through the sample goes to, uh, before you reach the objective lens. So those original idea really does not help you improve penetration. So today we're going to talk about that work happens in our group that uh, we basically, will, I'm going to talk about two projects, each one on the object to projection tomography, the other on light sheet imaging or basically select plan imaging, mm, on how we really, based on those two con basic concepts and how we implement new ideas to improve the penetration and combine high efficient and better penetration to allow us to image in 3D live systems in live. So here, the movie you see here is this is a live zebrafish embryo. You can have, it has two kinds of fluorescence labels. And GIP is labeling all the blood vessel. And here you have, this tiny dot here is M cherry. It's a, a red for a fluorescence protein labeled the kidney of the, the zebrafish. On the right side here, you see a video read movie of the heartbeat from the zebrafish has GIP label. So you can see the heart chamber is, has fluorescence. And uh, this is taken with uh, a two photon scanning light sheet system. So let's, let me start with the first project, scanning laser object, optical t projection tomography, or SLOT. So the idea of slot is simple. So when, when you have to go back a few pages, see the original object project tomography is actually um, works on, um, by using a kind of wide field illumination and shine the light and capture the projection with a camera. But certainly you can, what we can do is instead of wide field illumination, I'm going to use a laser beam and scan it across. Uh, across the sample. And here I want to do fluorescence emission projection. So instead of putting my uh, detector here, look at the shadows, I'm putting a condenser system with a concave mirror, a condenser lens on the side of the laser path to collect the emission. So on each point, I'm going to collect the projection pixel. And by scanning the laser beam across the sample, I end up with projection imaging. So this approach, scanning laser approach, actually has better penetration than the camera approach. You can see here, because uh, well, actually, if you strictly, the, the detection system actually is not an image system. All we care is uh, collecting all the light from the sample. So we use the condenser lens and the image and put it into a 
PMT. So by not trying to image, I don't I actually are less sensitive to scattering on the emission. So if there's a little bit scattering on the emission light, it doesn't come out straight, that's fine because this collection system is very tolerant to that. And that gives us better collection efficiency and better penetration. Another benefit of this approach is uh, instead of using camera, we use a single point detector. That means we can do a little bit spectral imaging with it. If I send him multiple laser in, so I excite a different color fluorophore at the same time, I can split the color into different PMT. That allow me to do multi-color image. So, the, uh, so we basically, uh, I think about two year, uh, five years ago, we go ahead and set a de build a system based on this idea. And our system actually has a, we want to shoot for a tissue penetration of one millimeter. That means we have to use a kind of a focused laser beam a little bit loosely so that the depth of focus is long. And the laser beam end up to be 15 micron wide across. So this is the first data set we got. I mean, this is the same double color fish. And well, I, mean, I think the first, when we got the first data set, we actually were very excited. We see a lot of color, we see the entire fish. But uh, actually, my collaborator is not very impressed at all. Because what we quicker learn, a lot of times, a cool image is not, doesn't equal to informative image. So if I, there's uh, something wrong with this set, set up. First of all, it's about the label we choose. We basically choose a fish that has a label on structure. I mean, everyone knows fish have blood vessels. Everyone knows fish have kidney. So what's, what, what's special about that? That's the label, actually, structural label sometimes doesn't give you much information. Especially if you think that we have our resolution is 50 micron, we're not going to see a single cell. So all those very kind of blurry skeleton type of structure, I mean, it's well known, it's not very useful at all. So really, to make this use for us, two things we can do. First, functional imaging. So even the image itself, resolution can stay low, but we want to be able to kind of grab some kind of embed functional information into the image. And secondly, certainly, we can improve the resolution. So we actually did both. So first thing we did is actually putting functional information in it. That is done by adding fluorescence lifetime imaging, combine that with slot. So fluorescence lifetime imaging is mm, basically described the decay behavior of a fluorophore. So a fluorophore, if you're excited with a pulse light, if you have a really fast detector, look at the emission, you can find that the emission doesn't happen simultaneously. And also, it decays very slowly. And um, by slowly, I mean in the time scale of a nanometer, oh, sorry, nanosecond. Um, so in order to measure this decay time scale, and you can use a pulse light, fast detector, but also you can use a modulate light and look at the emission modulation. You can see that uh, when you compare them in the time scale, you can see the, uh, the emission modulation, uh, emission has certain modulation amplitude, it also has a phase lag behind this um, excitation light. If I push the uh, modulation frequency up, you can see that the emission just start to kind of lag further, and this amplitude, uh, the modulation amplitude decrease. So this curve is actually exactly equals to the Fourier transform of this impulse response function. So that's very simple. Um, and in reality, actually, it's not simple. Here we're dealing with we need an ultra-fast pulse laser. A uh, detector can in the, with picosecond time scale. And here we're talking about modulation, scanning modulation from tens of megahertz to about 200 megahertz. So, but uh, we actually, are, um, the reason we, like, for instance, lifetime imaging is actually has been around for a long time. The reason people still are working on that is because it's very useful to uh, tell you the function, give you functional information of, about the living system. So uh, for a film or for instance, lifetime imaging is the most robust measure to imaging uh, uh, if I cause forced resonant energy transfer. So uh, it's actually, I shouldn't say invented, but it was published by Forster in the 1940s. And it's purely a classical quantum mechanical practice. I've seen physical professor giving out homework on it. So it has basically considered two dipoles, flow force are dipoles. Two dipoles, both can be excited, 
both can emit light. But the, one, the emission spectrum of one dipole we call donor actually overlaps with the absorption spectrum of the acceptor dipole. So that's the, basically the donor emission can resonant with acceptor absorption. So that's where the resonant name comes from. So then Forster considered that the two dipoles, if they're really close to each other, you start to have near field coupling between each other. In that case, if I excite the donor, there's a chance going to have energy, excited energy transfer from the donor to the scepter. And then in the end, the scepter will end up emit a redshift photon. So this, it, because this effect is really directly near, near field coupling, so it only happens within, say, less than 10 nanometer. And 10 nanometer is a significant number because a lot of molecules of biology is interesting is in that scale. Protein is average about 3 to 10 nanometer in diameter. So biologists found out that if I say interesting in protein A, I want to know when it can, uh, reacts with protein B. I can tag protein A with a green fluorophore and tag protein B with a red fluorophore. And when they are close to each other, I start to see the, in the emission spectrum become more red than less green. So that's the idea. I mean, it uh, sounds easy, but you, um, I think everyone know, uh, do measurement know that if you just look at how much red, how much green you have, intensity measurement is very hard to be precise. But another effect you're going to have when you have fret is because you have this energy kind of drained out from the donor, you will notice that the donor is going to decay faster. Donor lifetime is going to decrease. So by looking at um, image, the donor lifetime with fling, you should be able to detect fret or same, um, depending on your how you design the biological experiment, you will be able to see whether these two proteins are close together or not. So this is the uh, example data from cultured cell on our confocal flame imaging system. We have cells that expression a, a sensor, fret sensor, that's sensitive to this uh, C, uh, second AMP level. So this is a small molecule that very important to the cell signaling. And we add a drug in the cell after, see, after a few seconds when after we add a drug and take the image again can see this lifetime image here. So this is how we plot lifetime in the color map. The brightness indicated the brightness of fluorescence. And then the, this color, encoded color, tells you where the, uh, what's the lifetime. So we start with the lifetime about, uh, I would say, 2.2 um, or 2.1. And you see that after treatment, there's a slight increase. So the, this particular sensor that increase in the lifetime means the uh, second AMP level increases. So this is actually a, a system we already have. So if you have been out my early talks, because we have another line of research working on developing fast multiplexed fluorescence lifetime image method, we basically take multiple wavelengths of laser send it to a microsen, and it's move, by moving this microsen mirror really fast, we generate an interference signal. And since you see that the interference signal depends on the velocity of this mirror divided by wavelength of the laser, you can see that uh, the shorter wavelengths, for example, the blue light get modulated faster, and long wavelengths, red, uh, green light get modulated uh, slower. So that allows us to kind of send in both laser into the sample, Mirror the lifetime corresponding to each wave, uh, laser wavelength without really need to kind of switch them. They can happen together because the, those two uh, spectral channels are at different frequencies. So that's why we call it frequency multiplexed uh, flame or FM flame. So this is a system we already have in the, in the lab when we're starting working on deep tissue imaging. So this is more the uh, kind of um, a diagram of the, un um, the system. And this is the actual image of the system. It's all out of wires and cables because um, this, we're actually dealing with RF signal here. So there's a lot of electronics, uh, uh, RF signal processing, also high-speed data, data acquisition going on. So this system actually is built for confocal imaging. We basically scan a laser light on a sample. The sample mostly uh, it's, um, it's basically on, on cell catchers. But uh, since it's a scanning image measure, we can certainly combine with a slot. Instead of scanning um, confocal imaging from cells, we can scan projection imaging from a, a 
thick tissue, in this case, liver fish embryo. So when we combine flame with slot together, so instead of just the green and red color, we also see that uh, GIP lifetime is about 2.3. And here in the red channel, you can see there's a lot of red going on in the fish. Those are tissue autofluorescence. So a lot of tissue has natural, uh, natural fluorescence. If, uh, we don't, if we didn't do fluorescence lifetime imaging, we won't be able to tell them apart. They all look like red. But with the fluorescence lifetime, you can see that the autofluorescence has a very different lifetime with this um, here, the M cherry lifetime. So that's just one little example on how lifetime is useful. But most importantly, we can actually engineer different uh, biochemical sensors in the uh, uh, liver fish, and by using lifetime imaging to detect the sensing the and chemical levels within the fish. Here is the same second MP sensor expressed in this uh, liver fish in the neuron. And also the long tube here you see here are, are kidney tubes, tubules. You can see that this is the lifetime, the intensity image, two, co two color channel intensity image, and also lifetime of the donor before the treatment. After we like uh, treated the fish with this drug for two hours and remarry it again, you can see the all of the donor lifetime increases. So you can see this is basically prove that uh, the com by combining flame and slot, we can actually uh, p obtain functional information from liver fish. Even though the resolution is low, but uh, with the flat, we actually be able to tell reactions within nanometer uh, range. So you can see that with, uh, when we look at the section of the 3D data and look at uh, how much lifetime has changed, you can see even though they start at the starting point of different section is slightly different, they actually both strongly increased. So this is another sensor we did is a calcium sensor. And here the calcium sensor expressed in the kidney tubules here. And uh, also, the treatment increased the donor lifetime. In this case, the sense actually that indicated a decrease in calcium level. Okay. So here we have functional re re information now, but still we are not really satisfied with 15 micron resolution. So we go back and think how to get higher resolution. The reason we end up with a 15 micron resolution is because we want to penetrate the entire fish. We want a millimeter depth of focus. So with a Gaussian, traditional Gaussian focus, that means you can't just, you have to use a very small NA and focus loosely. But luckily, there's another kind of a beam called a basal beam, allow you to focus, focus beam tightly over extended depths. So the basal is basically achieved by putting an axicon lens or basically a kind of a cone-shaped face plate in the beam. And after that, you can, uh, through focus, you can end up with an uh, elongated extended focus beam. In our system, um, um, a lot of people use a basal beam. Um, the most easy way to generate a basal beam is actually using the SAM, put this kind of uh, axicon uh, face pattern on the SAM. Then at the output, you can have a basal beam with a center lobe that is extended really long and some sideband rings. The problem with our system is we want to kind of still be able to use multiple wavelengths. So if you're just using a simple method, you're going to end up with some dispersion, because face, any face pattern generates a dispersion. So first, we notice that different wavelengths has at different location. And also, to make things even worse, the shorter wavelengths, the, the, the focal size is smaller, the ring is smaller, everything, nothing is the same. So luckily, people have already figured out how to do that. If you combine a axon pattern with a gradient pattern, and then add a prism at a fluid plane to compensate for dispersion, you end up with a so-called achromatic basal. So all the wavelengths end up with the same at the same sh beam shape and the same location. So that is what we did. Uh, by com kind of switch from a Gaussian to a chromatic basal, we actually be able to improve our resolution to about a 2.5 micron. So here is a, a, a still a zebra fish. And then, um, it's the tail of the zebra fish expression, both GIP and um, cherry together. You can see that we actually were successful on kind of capture both the intensity and structure, and also the lifetime of GIP and um, cherry here. 
And the, in, on the right, you see the 3D render. On the left, you have the fly through across the fish. So, but unfortunately, at this point, we cannot imagine a whole um, embryo anymore because it just, uh, the, the data worm is just going to be huge. Because we jump from 15 micron resolution to 3 micron resolution. Okay, so let's go back my, to my kind of summary page. I've talked about uh, how we, our research on using scanning laser optic project tomography, combine that with fluorescence lifetime imaging to obtain functional information from fish. And uh, although this image looks cool, you see the entire fish. But I do think this is more useful because we see the fine uh, cellular structure. So let's, now let's move on to the second project that we have, we, I just, actually this is uh, something still ongoing. So by the end of this talk, I'm going to show you some preliminary data we got two days ago. Um, this is uh, the, on this line of research, we work on scanning laser light sheet imaging, and how we do, basically how to do image, 3D imaging with high resolution really fast. So if you go to the really the original uh, kind of measured uh, the slide I showed 10 minutes ago, the select plan illumination means that you confine illumination in the plan. You could use a cylinder lens to focus the light, but you can also use a regular lens or a spherical lens to focus the laser beam, and then scan this little beam across the sample to form a kind of a virtual plan. So this is what we did. And still also, when we do that, you can see light should still have this thickness versus field of view problem. So that means if you use a Gaussian, you, want, you still want a very narrow light sheet, you end up with a very small field of view. But we decided that from the beginning, you're going to use basal beam, so we have a thin, long sheet, and cross a large field of view. It allows us to do really high volume uh, imaging. And the, uh, so basal beam here is on top of being able to let us extend the field, we also have a secondary benefit. But it turns out the basal beam actually is very robust against the scatter. So this is a study done by a group like about seven years ago. They, had, they simulated and also did the experiment on sending Gaussian beam versus basal beam through um, a medium with a lot of uh, polystyrene spheres that scatters a lot. So this is our, the image result. You can see that when they have like a random position of the spheres, spheres with the Gaussian beam, after two spheres, the Gaussian beam just completely deviated from its path. And you basically don't have a really wide defined uh, plane anymore. Uh, don't, uh, so you, uh, here with the basal beam, you have a little scatter, you lo lo lose a little bit of energy, but the main emulation plan remains the same all the time. So that's the sec second benefit with basal. The problem with basal is if you look at the cross-sectional basal beam versus Gaussian beam, Gaussian beam is nicely confined, a single point. And basal has these sideband rings extended to a large area. So if I shine laser light through a sample, this is a die, and look at the kind of the, uh, look at the, the path of the Gaussian beam versus basal, you can see that the Gaussian beam is what you expected, strong focus and diverging faster. Then basal, you can still see, you can see it has an elongated focal. But then the sidebands generate a very kind of wide blurry background and a one photon excitation. But if we use a two photon excitation, you can see all the sidebands doesn't matter anymore because those intensity here and there is very weak. With Gaussian, you only have a tiny volume get excited. But with basal, we have a very extended area along a single line get excited. So this is not by me, not by, um, by me. This is from an, um, someone else's lab. I got grabbed from the web. So you can see that here we show that it's by going with two photon basal beam excitation, we kind of get rid of those kind of um, background problem. So the photon efficiency is higher. And also because the two photon excitation, as I said before, is very kind of, has, is, has less photon damage to tissue. And it will allow us to do much longer, uh, safer imaging. Also, if you compare two photon Gaussian versus two photon basal, you can see that even though probably the peak intensity within the basal beam is, is, is uh, 
less than the, two, uh, the Gaussian case, but because we have such an elongated line, and uh, we end up illuminating more volume than, you, than Gaussian two photon. So that's, that's why we decide from the first that's to how, the, the, how the project will go. We'll go ahead and build a system that using SM generate a uh, basal beam from a Tysafa laser, shine it onto the, our sample steel zebra fish in, in, uh, in this case, and then we move, scan this beam on, uh, perpendicular to the plan, into this kind of uh, paper plan to generate a li uh, light sheet, then capture that emission from that sheet with a simple imaging system here. Um, the system is designed with a uh, um, light sheet thickness about two micron, and also the lateral resolution about half micron. So we can see that if we shine, a, if we put a dye sample in the basal beam, this is the image we captured. You can look at the peak intensity on, on the line. So the full width half maximum of this uh, uh, light sheet is uh, over 500 micron. And if I look at the cross section, it tells me that the thickness of this light sheet is about two micron. And that allows to do really large area, two photon imaging, also at a very high speed. So this is one, I think, uh, um, until this week, this is the best movie I have. <laughs> so this is a laser fish heartbeat taken with two photon basal beam, a light sheet, uh, a basal light sheet. And the heart is with a bit, um, liver fish heartbeat is about uh, from 100 to 120 beats per minute. So here we are acquiring this movie in a, one section at 25 frames per second. And just uh, accidentally, if you look at frame by frame, uh, on top of seeing that the GIP labeled the heart chamber, we also see occasionally there is a blood vessel carrying GIP passing through. So for this particular fish, the, um, is a small percentage of blood, uh, blood cells has GIP label. So since we have 5 micron, 100 micron field of view, you can really see the entire zebrafish head. So you can see the cross section here is a fly through of light imaging stacks. Here um, on this side is the tail, and this is the head. The eye just passed by, and now we are approaching the back of the head. Another way to slice through is from the head and all the way, uh, take a cross section all the way towards the tail. You can see here. So you can see this movie really shows us that by using your photon wisely, shape your beam wisely, you can uh, improve your two photon, uh, improve your image speed very fast. So if you do two photon point scan, I can tell you the record high uh, frame rate is 30 frames uh, per second. And now we can have such a larger field view and easily approaching video frame rate. Um, but I also can tell you that this, in this data set, I kind of cheated. The reason I said I'm cheated, I cheated is because liverfish actually, um, when it's really young, what I mean is before three days old, it's extremely transparent. We talk about 3D image system, how a tissue is hard to image, but tissue, there are different kinds of tissue. Some tissue are really dense, not trans, opaque. And liver fish, young liver fish ambulance happen to be very transparent. But you can still see that by using our, our basal beam sending using two photon, we actually improve the penetration of the emulation. We actually, we didn't do, we didn't do anything to the penetration of the emission. So you can see that here when the light, the light sheet is in shallow layers, the image looks great. But when we move the light sheet into deeper layers, here is approaching heart. We still have signal, it's got blurred and the image looks horrible here. So that's the, st the problem. Um, when we see this image, we think about how we make it better. Well, in terms of the penetration, we only solve half of the problem. How we get the signal out clearly, with a, really get rid of those blurry things. And also to make things harder is I have a collaborator, interesting either fish kidney. And kidney is actually in, right in the middle of the fish body. It doesn't start to develop until the third day. And when I show a third, a third day movie to my collaborator, he said, oh no, you have to wait another day. Because it just started to develop, it doesn't have much structure. But by the fourth day, the fish looks like this. It's not transparent anymore. And also, and then that makes things very hard. If I just take a four, five, a four days fish, 
Due to image, this image uh, fish has a red in kidney tissue and green for for in, in the vessel. You can see that certain still have image signal, but everything is very blurred. Nothing really can figure out structure anymore. So for to do that, we actually introduce a structural emulation. So instead of using a uniform plan emulation, we use kind of a, we kind of scan the laser beam in steps. So in each exposure, only limit certain area within this plan. It's uh, end up with a stripe pattern. And here we have a look at the image CR. You can see when you excite the whole plan with the plan emission, you can see this whole thing is very blurry. You don't know what, what part of the signal is an unscattered ballistic signal, what part is scattered background. But when they shine it with stripe, you can see, I can tell certainly this part is the ballistic signal, and whatever in between is something scattered to, from who knows where. So by mo then we just take multiple exposures and in the meantime moving the stripe pattern um, step by step and uh, finish one entire cycle. Take, uh, take that multiple frames through data processing, through uh, structural emission reconstruction. We end up with a clear image of the structure without all those like a blurry background in the middle. So here is a comparison of a regular plan light sheet illumination versus structural emulation emulation. Structural emulation, you can see that now we can clearly see the uh, cellular structures. Let me show you some cross-section or be more clear. You can see this is a plain emulation versus a seam. And again, plain emulation versus a seam. Here you can really see that kidney is kidney tissue wrapped along the blood vessel. So basically kidney is a filter, filter out of the waste in the blood. Okay. So, so far I show you a lot of the zebrafish movies. We start with zebrafish because it's easy. It's transparent, it's a small fish, and also the animal protocol is not very hard to really learn. But really what we in really interesting in is mice. The reason that if you look at the evolution tree, in, uh, the fish is really somewhere in the middle and very far from human primates. So in terms of biological function, or the gene and how it works, how the organ looks like, a fish is very different from human. The advantage of those small kind of this, this kind of model system along this left side is because they are cheap, they are easy to manipulate. You can say in a fish, it only takes two months for for generation of fish to mature. So all those those are really good for some some study. But if you want to study more complex problem, for example, you want to know behavior, how brain functions, then fish is not an ideal model. We want to really move to the mice. The problem actually. There are a logistic problem that how do you bring mice into a, this building, and also there are practical limitations. When we set up a system, this is a typical system every lab does. We set up an optic table, take a large space, and also to make things worse, you can see here is where we put sample in, and blow up, you can see this is where it has a hole here. We put a fish in a tube and stick it in. There's no way I can stick a, a mouse in it. And also, a mouse probably doesn't like to be held vertically at all. So that means if you really want to make system better, we have to redesign the whole system and make it workable with mice. So also, the part, hard part with light sheet is, light sheet is, doesn't like traditional microscope. It has two imaging paths, two optic systems. You have the illumination optic system going this way, and the emission, the image system going in the opposite, uh, 90 degree. So everything has to be kind of rotate vertical now. So this is a new system which uh, we build over the summer. We actually design in the designing our lab in the summer. We're building in the neuron biology lab. We actually, the system is in this building. It's in operating in our neuron biology lab. So everything, all the optic path is traveling vertical, and we have the excitation path going this way, and the emission goes that, and that's the camera high up. So now I'm going to show you some preliminary data we just got two days ago. And with this system, we also optimize the, the image parameters to make it much faster. So we were able to achieve 100 frames per second in two-photon imaging over a field of view of 250 micron across, 150 micron um, vertically. 
and we actually use the electric uh, turnable uh, lens to kind of do depth training. This is a st depth training stack about 90 micron deep, and the actual penetration which we achieved is better than 100 nanometer. So here you can clearly see the penetration we have um, through the 3D rendering. So the scale here from the left side, this, the light, uh, light goes into from this side. So basically trying to penetrate about 150 micron into the tissue. Okay, so we also can do same on the same setup. So this is a comparison between plain light sheet. You see a lot of structure, but also a lot of scattering. But with a, a seam, we will be able to remove all the light scattering to see very clear structure in this end. But the drawback with the seam is we have to take multiple exposure. So the frame rate drops by, by five, factor of five here. And also, just I think Tuesday, we were able to see that to um, perform really fast volume metric imaging. With, uh, in, I, will, I will call it 4D imaging, it's X, Y, Z, and T. So here is a projection imaging of a brain cell, an expression of a sensor called a GCAM6. Basically, when a G -cam, the, the brightness of the sensor indicated the chasm level within the, within the cell. So here is a um, kind of lateral projection of the cell, and this is the side projection of the cell. Um, let me rewind it a little bit. So when you first start the image, nothing happened. Up at uh, here, you can see the chasm level increases. That's when, when like, we added potassium chloride in, into the uh, solution. And that increased the chasm level within the cell. So I know actually it uh, looks much worse than the head of the zebrafish, but actually it's much more useful for a biologist. So, so in the end, I would say, in summary, I just talked about two projects in our lab, and both focus on 2D, 3D imaging in, in deep tissue. One way is tomography. The advantage of using tomography is we can combine it with functional information, uh, functional image method. We can handle a large volume. The drawback is it's very slow, because you have to rotate the sample to the required image. On the other hand, we can also use two-photo imaging with basal structural light sheet, and that allows you to 100 frames per second imaging. And uh, it's not going to be uh, easy to put multicolor or uh, lifetime imaging in it, but the advantage of this is just really fast, allow you to do fast volumetric imaging over time. And also, another one you can see here is we ob observe this cell for five minutes, and it doesn't get bleached at all. So that allows you to do really long time observation. So in the end, you can see that it's, uh, in really, even in 3D live samples is challenging. You probably won't get, it's going to be hard to find one image or method allowed to do everything. But you, well, alternatively, you can combine different um, methods to kind of tackle the same uh, problem. So in the end, I want to thank my collaborators. Dr. Zhou in Mich uh, University of Michigan Medical School, he is the person that said, I want a four days fish. <laughs> and also Dr. Ding in Stanford Medical School, he is the person that said, I want 100 frames a second. So we struggled, but we made, made both happen. And also we are collaborating with um, Gus in our, our medical school on doing 3D tissue imaging. Also, also want to thank my current and also former group members. And the Ming Zhao is, the, um, is was responsible for building the uh, flame start system. He's now with Solabs, and Donli is right now you actually working in Stanford to help them learn how to use that uh, to form a light system. And our funding support comes from NIH. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs>